morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1 in by 1 in, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. Notice, I did not say we're trying to fund a million companies. That is not a doable job. Um, but we are, uh, we've categorically emphasized bootstrapped entrepreneurship and uh, even though we have our share of venture fundable companies, we obviously work with a lot of investors and uh, so forth. We also very, very systematically support uh, non venture style companies, bootstrap companies. So really revenue is what we, uh, you know, put front and center. We've been doing this for a very long time. These roundtables started with an experiment back in 2008 in the fall, and this is the 539th session. Over 150,000 people have participated in these roundtables over the years, and um, you know we have had the privilege of having a window into what's happening in so many ecosystems of the world. And it's really been a, an honor, a pleasure to get to know so many people in so many different parts of the world. This event is being recorded. Every single roundtable recording is available on our YouTube channel, 1M1M Roundtables. Please feel free to check them out. They are in, you know, interesting listening material if you're driving or, or so forth. Um, on Twitter, we're at 1M by 1M and at Romana, and hashtag for today is 1M, 1M. We publish a lot. These are the call-in instructions. You can use WebEx audio from your computer or you can dial in. Very, the, one of the reasons we use WebEx is to uh, make the calling process um, you know, simple. And uh, a lot of people dial in from low bandwidth areas these days also. So, uh, you know, penetration, democratization has been a big uh, value for us. Uh, but nowadays, a lot of it can be accomplished. If you're in a reasonable bandwidth place, you should be able to also dial in from your audio. We are going to start today's session with a very exciting program with uh, Jeff Ralston, a very long time friend of mine. Uh, we have been in Silicon Valley, both of us, for a very, very long time <laughs> and uh, seen the evolution of Silicon Valley in many, many, many different incarnations. So welcome, Jeff. It's great to have you here. Uh, Jeff is the president of Y Combinator. And has been <laughs> Jeff has been involved with Y Combinator right from the beginning, if I recall. So why don't we start there, Jeff? Let's, uh, let's kind of take a look back a little bit on the evolution of Silicon Valley on, and on the evolution of Y Combinator. Sure. Um, I'm getting, I apologize for the cat attack here. This is one of the um, <laughs> risks of doing talks from home. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, uh, I've been uh, actually at YC um, uh, working at YC for over 10 years now, and um, YC has been around for 16 years, but I, uh, I've known Paul Graham, um, one of the four founders, sort of the, the main force behind YC for even longer than that. We worked at Yahoo together in the late 90s, and as Paul began thinking about startups and started YC in the um, in 2005, 2006, 2007, I did um, get involved and go to, um, just from um, for my own learning, go to Demo Day and sort of watch what was going on and, and, um, and sort of got to observe firsthand how uh, organizations like YC and, and YC as the, as the real pioneer were changing how venture capital worked, how um, entrepreneurs could think about starting companies um, but I'll tell you, that does feel like a really long time ago, <laughs> back in the day. So what's changed in how you're operating now? 
you are now president. You've seen the beginning, you've seen the program era, you've seen uh, all the years in between. What, what has changed? Um, it's a good question. A lot has changed, but I, I actually usually like to talk about what stayed the same. So maybe I'll start with that and then talk about how we've evolved okay. over time. First, we're still a pretty small company. We're, we're bigger than we used to be, but we still feel like a, a startup ourselves. Most of the people at YC are startup people. And we, we really try to hold on to that ethos as much as we can. We still fund mostly hackers. And I, I, I think of that fairly broadly, people who hack software more was the original idea there, but we, we fund people who hack hardware, who hack business, um, who hack biology, who, who um, work in the field of synthetic biology or, or biotechnology. Um, we fund a whole bunch of companies all at the same time with common, simple documents. They don't tend to be more than four or five pages long. And we still run a three month program twice a year whose intention is to transform the trajectory of the companies that we work with. Um, when we started, we offered just a little bit of funding and advice, but we've really expanded the set of programs and the resources that we have for startups um, as they grow throughout their, their, their lifetimes, throughout their journey. Um, we, um, we really, you know, I, I resonate a lot to the, to the story of 1 million by 1 million. Um, we have something, as you know, called startup school, which is a free program that works with hundreds of thousands of founders. We launched in 2017. We have programs to help people find jobs at startups, work at a startup. We have a program called our series A program that works with companies right after the, our batch program, our early stage program. And then we have a growth program and indeed a growth fund that funds people um, later and later on. Um, we have, a, a, we're, I think of ourselves more now than, than the very beginning as a, a company built upon a software platform. So we have this very elaborate software stack and a, and a software team to go with it that builds the software that Startup School runs on, the, uh, our entire missions process runs on, that the batch itself and demo day runs on now more than ever since we're entirely virtual since the pandemic as well. And of course mm -hmm. we have community software and financial software. So, um, so you know, the, the, the founders and the companies that we fund have kind of stayed the same and kind of expanded too. We, um, we have funded way more international companies. Uh, the last batch we funded half, half the companies that we funded were, um, were international and the batches are much bigger. Our first batch in 2005 was eight companies and our most recent batch is 400 companies. So we're funding a lot more companies over time. So a lot of the same, but expanded in, 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 um, and, and, ex, and a more expansive view as to how we can help startups in their, um, in their, in their journey from the, the very, from the idea stage until hopefully they, they, um, they have a more, uh, in, more expansive impact on on the world potentially by going public or or the like so just uh, let me uh, steer the conversation in a in the direction that would be the most helpful for our community of people who might be interested in applying to y combinator sure. and um, there's a there's some amount of confusion around what is ideal for a y combinator as you saw very recently in our exchange with bruno um, there is you know, when you think of an accelerator, the word accelerator or the word incubator, people tend to think that it's very, very early stage. And um, I, we've done quite a few Y Combinator case studies that came in with, um, you know, that applied to Y Combinator after doing a significant amount of bootstrapping and then going into Y Combinator. So clearly you are accepting people who are further along. So. So dispel these uh, confusions a little bit and, and, and help us understand what is uh, acceptable. Um, yeah, I, I know a, a lot of venture capitalists sort of talk about their, the stage of investment that they work with. And we, we're not really a, a typical venture capitalist. We don't really see the world that way. 
Um, and the question is somewhat meaningless for our batch program. We think of ourselves as a school for startups. So when a startup can derive value from being part of our network, from the advice we give, from um, being associated with Y Combinator, then that startup is a good candidate for the program. Now, this is usually a pre-Series A company. Once you've raised 10 or $20 million and have a board and have a, um, a set of investors in that complex context. Complex cap table. Yeah, a complex cap. You, well, uh, we see a lot of companies with complex cap tables. I don't know if that's the, <laughs> that's the dividing line, but it is true that, that, that it's infrequent, although it has happened, but it's infrequent that post series A companies will do our, our core batch program. So that's maybe the dividing line that will help people, but it is true that okay. we have funded companies where there, there are just two or three founders and just an idea all the way to companies with um, even uh, eight figures of revenue. But again, the, we do trend earlier than, rather than later, and it's a little more unusual that a company like that will seek to derive value from YC. But sometimes in particular cases, it will make sense for them. Hope that helps. You have said a bunch of things that let me try to unpack here. Okay. International. So um, you still, of course, COVID has been a, a game changer on the virtual side. Um, be, until before COVID, you wanted people to come and be in Silicon Valley for the three-month program. Um, what is your current perspective on geography? Do people do a virtual program and then can be anywhere, be doing their company from anywhere? Um, well, it, it is certainly true that the pandemic left all of us with few choices in that matter. Yeah. So the, um, the end of the winter 2020 batch was entirely virtual and our, our demo day, the, the time when all of the companies describe what they're doing to venture capitalists from around the world had to be entirely virtual. It, it was obviously impossible in 2020 to bring a whole bunch of folks together, not just in one country, but from around the world into a single room that was going to be impossible. So our summer 2020 batch was entirely virtual. Our summer 2020 demo day, we completely rethought and rebuilt as an entirely virtual program. And that is, of course, true, for, was across also true for the winter 21 batch and the summer 21 batch, which is going on right now, is entirely virtual. The, our perspective on the future is changeable. We're not sure. We're, we're trying to figure out what 2022 will look like, um, whether there'll be an in-person component as well as a virtual component. Certainly, we've learned a lot about how effective we can be uh, as a virtual mm -hmm. accelerator, but I, 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 will, I, will, I won't commit to anything in particular for 2022 because I just don't know what that year is going to look like. As things settle down in the post-pandemic world, will will evolve YC once again to being somewhat different. I don't expect it'll be exactly like it was during the pandemic. I expect there will be some in-person component, but I just don't know how much yet. And in the meantime, while you're operating as a virtual company, the investors are also investing in companies all over the world, right? Right. One well, of the most um, surprising things about the pandemic was investors' willingness to invest over yeah. Zoom. I apologize to WebEx but mostly it's Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but it turns out, it, you know, we, it, uh, you know, I, I remember this like it was yesterday when we, we got together in a room and said, we have to stop. We cannot have, we, you know, our batch can no longer meet together. It's not, it's not safe. It's not ethical for us to do it. And we are not going to be able to have a demo day um, like we yeah. normally do, which is this incredible, you know, it, it's, it, it became the venture capital event of the year, twice a year in Silicon Valley with thousands of investors coming together. And it was, it was really cool, but um, impossible to do. And so we really wondered, will investors just completely stop investing? What approach will they take? Is the world just completely shutting down? And in fact, what happened was investors recognized this 
as an extraordinary opportunity for the acceleration of the digital world and the digital trends that were happening anyway. And so what investors did was they opened up their wallets and said, we will meet with people virtually and we'll yeah. invest in them. And I don't know that that's ever going to change. Yeah, no, I don't think that's going to change. The other wonderful thing that has happened is people are much more willing to do deals. You know, and the customers are much willing to buy, much more willing to buy just over a Zoom call or, uh, you know, some sort of a digital conversation. And There's, that's been phenomenal it, for international startups to totally. be able to sell. For startups everywhere, international, local, it's, you know, the, there are enormous efficiencies to be gained, not commuting. <laughs> you know, exactly. you have cats going back and forth. I get that. <laughs> so you have some downsides. But the reality is I can do this meeting with you and then immediately go to another meeting. And that other meeting could be virtually, I could be in India or I could be in France or I could be on the East Coast of the United States and I can do it instantly. Um, there's a loss and we shouldn't, all of us who are being virtual here should not forget that. And if you are starting your virtual startup and deciding not to be in a room together, there's loss there. Frankly, I will tell, I will be honest. If I were starting a startup tomorrow, I would have everyone in a room together. Uh, that's, that's just me. And maybe I'm old fashioned. And there are some amazing YC startups that have never been in person. A startup like Zapier or GitLab who have never been in person and are, have built incredible companies that way. Still. You know, yep. it, it, there is something to being in, in, in contact with a real human being <laughs> across the table or um, having a cup of coffee together. And I think having finding the right happy medium between those uh, being yeah. in person sometimes and yet being virtual and getting all the efficiencies of virtual will be the essence of really effective. This is a good segue work. into my next question, which um, I, I'm, I'm going to preamble that question by uh, giving you our experience. You know, we built 1 million by 1 million as a virtual company, as a virtual accelerator and a virtual company. We have people who have been working with us for a decade and we've never met in the Philippines and in India, etc. We have never met these people, but, you know, it's been a phenomenal experience and we're very close. It's a small team, continues to be a very small team, we're very close. Um, but but the, the phenomenon that I, we see, we have been seeing this actually, this trend uh, for a while, and in COVID it has accelerated tremendously, bootstrapping with a paycheck. In fact, we see bootstrapping entrepreneurs getting quite far, you know, customers, revenues, even break even without quitting their job. So at 1 million by 1 million, we have no problems. We are like you, we are in the you know, pre-series A zone, right? So we don't care if it's napkin stage or, you know, whatever. We work with that entire spectrum of seed, pre-seed, friends, family, and fools, napkin, whatever, you know, post-seed, that whole spectrum. But um, typically, you know, investors have not liked to invest in companies that are in operating in this mode. And this, this category, by the way, uses virtual company architecture extensively. So what, uh, what are you seeing? What is your perspective on this category? It's a force right now. Uh, so uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure how you're defining the category, but let me talk a little bit about, uh, about bootstrapping. Um, so we usually divide, sorry. Specifically bootstrapping with a paycheck. If they're keeping their jobs and they're starting a company on the side, they're starting to validate and, you know, getting quite a bit further before quitting their jobs. They want a validated business before quitting. That's um, the specific category I'm talking about. I remember when um, in, in 1993, this is maybe before some of your listeners were born, I... Um, I was working at Hewlett Packard and a friend called me up and, and said, have you, have you seen mosaic? And I said, what are you talking about? And I had exactly was, the same conversation that I might be in my office. My office might say, have you seen mosaic yet? I'm like, what are you talking about? You so just mosaic nervously was, our conversation. For those of you who don't know, mosaic was the um, first web browser. It was invented by Mark Andreessen and his colleagues at the NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing at Shurbana, 
um, um, Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, at the University of Illinois. And it was the first brow web browser that integrated graphics and text, which might seem stupid to all of you now, but it was cool back then. Uh, anyway, my friend called me. I saw that and I quit my job three weeks later because I knew that was the future. And my, my boss at the time, he looked at me and said, don't quit before you know what you're doing. Stay, like get a paycheck, boot, go, do, don't do it. For me, I couldn't do that. I had to jump, I had to take the leap. And my message to people who are bootstrapping by taking a paycheck, there is a long, long, long history of successful entrepreneurs who waited until they were really ready and saved money or did whatever they did by taking a paycheck and then jumped. But that being said, you gotta take the leap at some point. By the way, that's why YC gives you $125,000. It's not really meant to be like your first real venture round. It's enough money so you can survive. We used to give you $20,000 so you could eat ramen <laughs> during the summer <laughs> while you were trying to do your startup. Um, it, it is a um, harsh truth that doing a startup is about the hardest thing you can do professionally. And if you're not in 120%, it's hard to really build a successful startup. But that doesn't mean you can't choose the right time to make the leap for yourself. But eventually, if you're not all in, I do not know of a massively successful company that was built um, with part-timers. It just doesn't well, tend no, to I, work. I think nobody wants to start a company to remain a part-timer forever. But I think, you know, see the world that I look at, the lens with which I look at is scale, in terms of the numbers of entrepreneurs getting to some degree of success. You're looking up at the universe from, you know, how many of these companies are going to be billion dollar, $10 billion, $100 billion companies. I'm looking at the universe of how many, you know, how can we get more of them to a million dollar company and to sustainability and so forth. So, you know, you have a 97% rejection rate, I have a 0% rejection rate. So I have to think of ways that these people can survive, right? So. Most of them don't qualify for any seed yeah. capital, so they have to somehow survive. And paycheck is one of the techniques we have identified as, as a viable survival strategy until you get to the point where you can quit and go full time. Well, we're actually more aligned than you might think, Sramana. Um, I'll say two things, or a few things. First of all, it's 98% rejection rate, so we only take about 2% for our <laughs> best you. That being said, that being said, um, there's more startup content on YC uh, on, on our on our website um, than anywhere else on the web, or at least more valuable in my opinion. Startup school is entirely free and gives you um, a, a lot of the benefit of the knowledge that we have as to how to start a company that that is relevant across different types of companies. And I think lifestyle companies, as we call them, which are not really venture backable, because those companies that you're talking about, they're fantastic. They're just not going to get venture financing because for a simple reason, venture capitalists can't get their money out of those companies. There's no way, there's not a public market for those companies. You can't get a return on your investment. And you have to understand venture math, right? Venture capitalists have limited partners who invest the money that they then invest and they demand a return. So venture capitalists just can't invest in those companies. That doesn't mean that's not a perfectly valid way to build a company and have a really successful outcome. In fact, what I like to tell, um, founders is that lots of times you can become very wealthy doing that without venture capitalists. It's just a different path that you take. And we really fully support that. But it is true that for our batch program, we're assuming that your startups in the sense that you're going to grow fast, that you're going to need venture financing to finance that growth, and that therefore you're not looking to create a lifestyle company. Right, exactly. So, I mean, for us, our, our spectrum is broader than yours. Yours is you know, specifically the ones who will get funding. Uh, we forgive, have me I, forgive me if I disagree. You're, you're, broader than the batch. you're broader than the batch, but YC is broader than that. So, <laughs> if I can, if I can be disagreeable there, Shramana, we agree. Yeah, you, you can know, be disagreeable. We, we I, can, I can be disagreeable too. I think my content is the best in the whole thing. <laughs> But that's okay. It's debatable and it doesn't well, matter. We can argue about that all day. As long as the content's out there and free. Look, when I was trying, first wanted to start a company in the 80s, none of this content was available. Nobody knew. And now there's exactly. so much great, exactly. free, freely exactly. available content. So many great okay. programs to help you get that 
take that first step and become That's successful. That's the most important thing. That's the most important Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, I have another couple of nuances that we are seeing, just like this bootstrapping with a paycheck is a nuance. There are, there's bootstrapping with services, and very good companies are coming out of this mode of entrepreneurship. And of course, you know, Oracle was founded in this mode. Alteryx is one of my favorite case studies. <laughs> you know, the guy, uh, first I met him in 2013, uh, Dean Stoker, and he told me this incredible bootstrapping with services story. They've gone public since, et cetera, et cetera. They have raised money. They, I mean, all of the many of these companies eventually raise money, but they bootstrapping the services for enterprise software is a very, very effective way of getting close to customers, identifying problems, really deeply understanding the problems before turning a product, turning a services project into a product. This we are seeing in droves, and we support this. We've supported this all along. Um, very effective. Do you do you like this genre? Uh, do you have a pushback against it? Um, it, it it's, it's not a main line of growth for an enterprise product because um, what you end up doing is building a very specific product for a very specific company and, um, and they tend to be very demanding and it's different from creating a general product that you can, that you can sell everywhere. I will say this, look, there's an enormous amount now more than ever of venture money available for B2B enterprise businesses. However, every entrepreneur has to find their path, has to go after their dream. And if the right way to do that is to get consulting fees and service fees from a company that is willing to pay you to build software, that can be a fantastic path if you have no other path. I think you should exhaust your possibilities first and then take that possibility if there's if there's nothing else available. And it is absolutely true that Sermana and I can 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 point to cases where service uh, companies bootstrap the services have turned into independent successful companies. It's a little unusual for that to be the case, but it's not impossible. It's certainly a viable path. And the customer intimacy aspect is something that I like a lot because these, you know, customers are giving lots of input and that input is valuable to, to figure out how to scope the product, especially well, enterprise software and enterprise software is complex. Totally. I mean, you, you, you probably know that our motto is make something people want, but we actually say, have go a, a little love deeper when we talk to our batches and say, look, there's pretty much two things you should be doing right now. And the way we put it, which you have to think is meant to be somewhat symbolic, is we say you should write code and you should talk to customers. And what that really means is you should build things, whatever you Absolutely. build again, and then you should talk to your customers and know them as deeply as possible and understand whether the, what you're building is delivering value, is adding value, is creating, you know, product market fit. <laughs> and you do that on yeah. an iterative basis pretty much throughout the lifetime of the company. So the last um, of these creative bootstrapping techniques I want to uh, dialogue on is bootstrapping by piggybacking, which is there are a bunch of past platforms out there. Salesforce, of course, was the pioneer in this field. Now there are more of those. And great companies like Viva, Velocity, all of these are, you know, Viva is a stupendous company. Velocity was acquired by Salesforce eventually for over a billion dollars. Aptus, Map Anything, uh, Map Anything was also acquired by Salesforce. These were all built on the Force.com original Force.com platform. Um, a lot of, you know, not having to build the whole stack saves you a lot of money. So this is something that people like Peter Gasner understood very early and and. Um, Renee Bonvani was running Salesforce Incubator. I remember Renee invited me to come in and gave me a whole tour, and I did a whole story on that way back when. Um, so this is something we're seeing more. Atlassian is doing a path strategy, that, and they have a lot of developers and a lot of startups. Snowflake is trying to do one. So this is becoming more and more um, of a phenomenon. So how do you view this trend that is coming along now? Um, well, I think it's terrific and I, I will say, I, I, I don't think there's anything new here. Except for the availability of platforms at perhaps different levels. Think about it. 
every entrepreneur builds their company on the infrastructure that's available. And those, those infrastructures might be platform. In the beginning, it was the web. That was the platform that people built on. And then maybe it was Google and using the, the ability to use AdWords to get traffic to your site. And maybe it was Facebook later, or maybe it was Zynga if you're building a game platform. There was lots and lots of platforms that, uh, that, that became available. AWS. Apple, Apple, this... I, it's, uh, Apple SDK was one of the most successful of the uh, developer Apple, platforms. AWS, this expansion of platforms on which you can begin your company. Um, we have a company called Shogun that, that built their business originally on Shopify and is then expanded from yeah. there as they, as they helped companies build websites on Shopify. There's, the, there's enormous availability and possibility by these platforms that get to scale. Uh, one, one other um, aspect of this that I'll point out that I'm super excited about, as some of you might know, I started on a sister accelerator of Y Combinators called Imagine K-12 focused on educational yep. technology. And what's really cool about ed educational technology is that companies in that space have created platforms on which other ed tech companies can build. Companies like Clever that built a platform with distributed mm -hmm. software into schools. Companies like Class Dojo who created a platform that's available in essentially every elementary and middle school in the United States. The possibility that those platforms represent is are enormous, and I think I think a boon to entrepreneurs everywhere. And by the way, of course, to the customers who are who are served by those platforms. The big, uh, I would say, the big differentiator now in that trend is the level of abstraction. There's so much more abstraction, and you can do this thing so much more easily and effectively just because there's so much work that has gone into That's making right. it easier for developers. I so, think that's right. Um, the structure, okay. the infrastructure that we used to build on were pipes, and then higher and higher, higher levels of abstraction all along. I think that's, I think that's right. That's also true, by the way. Like uh, another, another piece of infrastructure that entrepreneurs can build on now is open source, right? Open source has provided this enormous amount of capability, freely available to use with your, with your product. And I think that that as well as those other platforms are are making. Um, you know, is one of the forces driving entrepreneurship, which is why we get an increasing number of applications, batch on batch on batch. We get over 15,000 applications for the, each batch now. And I think a lot of that is because entrepreneurs see the possibilities in all these platforms. Yeah. Um, solo entrepreneurship is a subject that's coming up a lot in our universe. Um, Paul Graham never liked solo entrepreneurs. So what is your perspective now, uh, you know, 16 years down the line? Uh, I actually think that's a mistake, a misstatement of what PG would say. Um, I, I, we have funded, we have always funded solo entrepreneurs. We have funded some amazing solo entrepreneurs with, you know, incredible success track records. Um, that's, that's not our opinion about solo entrepreneurs. Our, our opinion about solo oh, entrepreneurs is... <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> our, our opinion on solo entrepreneurs is simple, which is that your probability of success as a solo entrepreneur is lower. Why is that? Because entrepreneurship is so hard. It's just so hard. It's psychologically hard. The vast. I, I by the way, I have I have personal experience with this. I tried to be a solo entrepreneur, and I am not that person. It's too hard. I couldn't do it. I needed a team. I needed partners in that. Most people do. And, and it's not just because there's so much to do, <laughs> like there's an infinite amount to do. So if you can divide that as a startup founder, so if you can divide that in two or three, that's good. But um, there's another aspect, which is that because of the inevitable ups and downs of a startup, you need, you need like when you're down, you need your partner to say, you can do this, we can do this, we're good. And it's super hard. So it takes a very special kind of entrepreneur to be able to do it as a solo founder. And when we, so we just have a higher bar, I would say. And when we find someone who's like, okay, I don't care. This person's awesome. They're going to do it fine. But for most of us, most of us, normal human beings, it's, it's just, you know, it's a step too far. It is an emotionally difficult journey. Entrepreneurship is an emotionally very, very challenging journey. Psychologically, very, very challenging journey. No question. Right. You know, my favorite solo entrepreneur case study is service now. Fred Ludd, he started as a solo entrepreneur and I met him in 1999 or somewhere around there. So, 
you know, and he, he told me this amazing story of just kind of doing it very, very organically and selling to customers and then, you know, yeah, the rest it's, of it's hard and it's lonely and it's, you know, it's really difficult. So, um, you know, in when, general is very, very, uh, very hard. It's a very, very difficult path. Yeah. Last week we had uh, Ben Narison here and, and he made a statement that, uh, you know, don't come to me if you're looking for work-life balance. And I push back on that because, you know, if you don't, if you can't maintain good mental health, it is very difficult to run the marathon. You know, you burn out. You, you, you know, know, you're gonna, you're gonna flame out. I, I talked a little bit about our sort of the, our 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 mantra inside YC: write code and talk to users. Um, but we actually, we've expanded that a little bit. We say what you should do is at least during YC, but then beyond is you should write code, talk to users and get exercise and eat <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and like stay sane because uh, over time we've realized that we really need to, 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 to sort of beat people over the head with the fact that if they burn out <laughs> and they have no life and they're miserable, they're, that actually reduces their probability of success as opposed to the opposite. So it actually is super important that you stay sane and find some balance in your life. Life is too short otherwise. That doesn't mean you have to work your butt off, but you better, you know, find a way to balance that with, with something else that keeps you sane. Jeff, I'll take a question from the audience. Actually, Bruno Boschokow is asking you, I'm starting to raise a free feed round at a given valuation. Well, valuation is TBD. If I get accepted to the winter batch, how do I explain the YC deal that is lowering the valuation of the company to existing investors? Um, so, Paul Graham wrote an essay called The Equity Equation a long time ago. And basically, the simple idea is that whatever equity, that, that you should take the deal YC gives, or whatever equity it is, as long as you believe that we increase the value of the company more than a little bit more than the equity that we get, you know, so if we take 7%, we have to increase the value of the company by 7.3%. If you don't believe that about YC and your investors don't believe it, you shouldn't do YC. Now we'll make the case that we transform trajectories of companies and increase the value by way, way, way more than that. And most investors around the world nowadays understand that. Our track record, I think, speaks for itself and the set of companies that we've worked with and um, companies' ability to raise funds once they're part of the YC program and, and, and hopefully achieve success after that. So what you can tell your investors is this is going to help us all be successful, so I should take it. And again, sometimes that's a conversation with investors, but it's really infrequently a problem in today's world. I will uh, take one last question from the audience. Uh, Monica Chan is asking you what's different from what you learned from being part of the YC program and the startup school? Is it primarily mentorship and access to a fantastic network of investors slash founders? Um, well, it's different. You know, um, it, it, it's, um, you're, you're taking a correspondence course versus being involved in an intense um, uh, boot camp focused on your startup. And um, the level of personal attention that you get, the label that you get as a YC company, the connection to the network that you get to your batch mates, to the entire broader community of YC is way different by being part of the batch. Very good. I think 840 was your cutoff. We have managed Q&A and everything and got you out of here by 840. Thank you, Jeff, for coming. It's great to see you. Great nice to catch to up. You. We'll talk again soon. Thank you, Sarana. Good luck to everybody with your startups or whatever your path is in life. I hope everything goes well and everyone stay safe. Bye. Bye. Folks, we are going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch session. Know that this is a safe working session. We are on your side, and um, there is absolutely no other agenda but to help you accelerate your journey. 
So um, if you disagree with me, that's fine. You do your venture, it's your venture. Listen to the input, decide how to process the input, the pushback, et cetera, and, and go right along. We are going to start with Bindu and uh, Natalia. Um, Bindu is going to pitch, right? That's right. What is the name of the yes. company? I just the name of the company on this slide. But go ahead, Bindu. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, actually, uh, I used your uh, own, uh, you know, PPT template and you know that uh, five slide template. <laughs> so okay. anyway, okay. So can you please go ahead? Uh, so our company name is Remind. So we are building a jewelry that uh, helps you track your uh, self care reminders. So we are going to have one beautiful bracelet. All it will do is, it is a no, no screen bracelet. All it will do is it will remind by sending vibrations. And the basic intention of this particular bracelet is to separate your well-being reminders from work-related notifications. And we have a companion app to this bracelet, and which actually helps with the flexible scheduling for consistent practices you know, for the entire day. And it has an idea box also where very simple ideas and the tools to support will be there in that, uh, uh, you know, companion app. Um, please go ahead. Okay, our target user is Gen G. So, uh, as per the APA report at present, 91% of Gen Gs have some kind of a psychological symptoms due to the stress. Okay, this is actually one of the most stressful generations that, you know, in the human history. But Gen Gs are very uh, different, uh, uh, you know, social conscious beings. Okay, they already started focusing on their well being. They believe in holistic health and they believe in prevention. If you actually see, almost more than 45% of Gen Gs already started doing some kind of a meditation and started practicing some kind of mindful rituals. So they believe in prevention. So this is actually one of the topmost concerns of the Gen Gs. Also, these are, as they said that, you know, these are the digital natives, right? That, you know, the Genjis. So the convenience is most very important for them. So because these are digital natives, they started looking, I mean, they look for the solutions in the, in the digital world only. But at the same time, they don't have any time for the practice at all because these are very highly socially conscious generation and also very socially active generation. So... Our product is basically targeting this group because what we feel is if we actually give them a, a, fashion, con a fashion statement in the form of a well-being uh, product, which actually helps them to follow their self-care rituals in a very silent and a subtle manner. And at the same time, the app actually provides them a facility to connect with a tribe because they are, they are, because they are socially conscious, we cannot actually stop them you know, from being uh, from doing their activities alone. They need that uh, uh, feature that, you know, to be connected always. Uh, please go ahead. <laughs> Next slide, please. So uh, what we are doing is at present, uh, what we noticed is this 91% students in US are suffering from stress. So 33% are already started looking for some kind of a digital solution to uh, manage their stress. So the first, our early adopters will be going to be these students. We are going to uh, go to the universities and start talking to them and start actually selling our concept idea, et cetera, stuff like that. So of course that, you know, we started already uh, building a community and we, we will go to the crowdfunding campaign so that we can introduce the concept part of it. And of course the direct sales through our website. So since it is available, so the, the, the general idea is that, you know, we uh, in order to, we need to get the volumes, right? For the variables that, you know, to become profitable. So definitely that, you know, we have to go to the distributors networks and the e-commerce platforms. And at the same time, we have to promote this product using the social media ads or the influencer marketing, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. Now saying all this, one more revenue stream we started thinking about is collaborating with the jewelers. So what we noticed with the jewelers is, jewelers are not very, um, uh, what can I say that they're, they're, they're not very uh, into the innovation part of it uh, with respect to the uh, mobile apps or anything like that. But there are many startups already started coming up right now. It is Bella Beat and stuff like that, they, which are providing these uh, jewelry or in other words, you know, uh, beautiful jewelry that has one digital uh, solution. So what we thought is, that you know, we have the solution in our hand. We, if we can collaborate with the jewelers 
as technical partners and uh, and if we can create these beautiful uh, jewelry lines uh, targeting the genjis i feel that you know uh, we think that you know we have really uh, uh, able to generate the revenues faster than you know in an on in a organic way so this is definitely one stream that you know we started looking into yeah please go ahead so uh, as i said that you know our customer validation is uh, 20% of us population for the genji they are almost 72.1 million today and they have a monthly average spend of 460 dollars 460 dollars and in that 20% they spend on jewelry so I am actually bracketing this product as a jewelry product only because if you actually see our mobile app, it is a very simple mobile app. So, uh, I mean, that is the reason we are positioning, uh, positioning it as a smart jewelry product. So they have this yearly spend of $104, sorry, uh, $1,104. So 23% of US Gen Gs are already engaging in some kind of meditation practices so these are the people that you know initially we are targeting we are going we are planning to uh, explain them that you know since you are already into the meditation why don't you buy a beautiful jewelry that helps you that you know to follow these practices uh, throughout the day so uh, we are planning to sell this bracelet for 130 dollars and so this actually comes to a total market of around 3.81 billion us dollars yeah, please go ahead. Hmm. I'm not convinced about the pricing, but let's keep going. I'll let me listen yeah, to yeah. You. that's all actually because it is a five slider. Uh, you know uh, that. Uh, but if you want, let me listen to your questions, and I will. I'll give you more feedback. So go yeah. ahead. So this is actually one of, uh, so what at present we are doing is we are working on two streams. One is the crowdfunding. We are preparing for the crowdfunding. And the second one is we are building the communities using uh, uh, Instagram and the, you know, Facebook ads, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. But we actually fell into this, uh, into this cycle of that crowdfunding is, of course, is, a, is an expensive affair that, you know, unless and until you see the customer tractions that, you know, you cannot get any funding. But uh, so we are not very sure that you know how well, to bring this uh, cycle. Work until you have a community uh, that you can bring onto the crowd platform and seed the crowd platform. So, uh, so it becomes very expensive actually to just run the campaign. Um, yeah, yeah. You need to find the community that you can sell to. Can okay. you can you get can you get this com this product to the hands of customers? I mean, it's a product, right? It's a, what yes. is the cost of the product? What's, what's the cost of manufacturing this product? Uh, the, the simplest one is at present uh, $30. $30. $30, yeah. So you're gonna need to get get this to the hands of people and, and uh, you know, start, start generating revenue. It, it's not so, you know, these kinds of products, consumer products. We have to show, somehow show that consumers will adopt a product like this before investors are going to invest. Consumer products are not easy to invest in. Yes. To you know to raise money for. So you're going to have to show somehow traction. If jewelers are a channel that gives you um, you know orders, you know if a jeweler gives you an order for a hundred units. Go for it. Get a bunch of jewelers and, and start getting it in the hands of people. Okay. If you can okay. start generating revenue and start showing that the market is adopting it, that is incredibly important for raising money. Don't expect to raise money without that validation exercise. Okay. So now that Neither you make... or angel funding is viable at the moment until you can get the product in the hands of users, paying users. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, I understand that point, but I'm saying that, you know, yeah, of course, that, you know, jewelers is one thing that, you know, we, uh, we are very actively uh, looking at collaborating. Um, but, but saying that, uh, so the thing is, in the place of uh, um, uh, customer tractions, do you think that, you know, we can actually show uh, the activeness in our community forum and then go to the uh, angels for the funding? Do you think that will work? You know, the general thing that I see in consumer products is people want to see traction. Okay. So okay. somehow or the other, you have to get the product in the hands of actual customers. People will not, what you're saying is you want to fund 
You want people to fund the concept. And there's a very, very small sliver of people who would fund the concept. Okay. And that's hard to get to. I understand. Okay. I understand. Yeah, I understand. Okay, and also actually you can see that actually product actually falls between uh, this fashion and wellness, right? So, so we always have this confusion that, you know, how to position the product that, you know, whether we have to position it as a wellness product, whether we have to position it as a fashion statement. So there is this um, uh, dilemma that we have. So what it do you think? It is a pure fashion product. product. You know, it is not a pure fashion product. It is a wellness product. A wellness product, so, right. Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a designer wellness product and that's the positioning okay. that you have to go for. This is not a fashion product. Okay. I've worked in the fashion industry, as you probably know, I ran a fashion company. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to move on. We can come back to you if we have time left, um, Bindu. Um, okay, let sure. me, let me go to the next presenter. Wait a second. What happened here? Maureen, I'm going to Teresa. Is that culture talk? Okay. Teresa, could you please unmute your line? Good morning. Can you see me? Or hear me, I should yes, say? Yes, I can see you. Fine. Go ahead. Awesome. Okay. Um, so, to set this up, Shramana, um, we last spoke with you regarding the customer pitch. And we shared that we are going to the um, L and the training and developments um, ATD conference at the end of next month. So we were looking for a way to get in front of the lead, um, you know, the, the head of training and development at, enter at the enterprise level, and um, recognize that they needed a different specific message. Um, in addition to the channel partner strategy that we are still working on for the HCM companies. Um, so this pitch is really, uh, we wanted to come and get your feedback on this idea and the strategy for getting in front of the L and D team, because it combines both the culture talk product, as well as the delivery mm -hmm. of some services, which we've had success with. And we've got a couple of, of strong case studies where we've done this very effectively. So we're, we want to, okay. this is like kind of a 1st round of a new idea that we're looking for your feedback on. So. Okay. Um, I'm going to pitch to you like you're the head of an L and D. Is that the most effective way to do this? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, great. Um, all right, so, so Shimon, I cannot move these slides. What's going on? Do I not have control over these slides? What's going on? Oh, no, I can. All right, good. Go ahead. <laughs> Great. Um, so, Sharon, thank you for your time today. Um, we really appreciate the opportunity to introduce you to Culture Talk as a framework that's going to support you in the development of a new modern identity for the L&D function at 1M by 1M. Um, we know that you're responding to transformative changes that are happening both in the field and in the shape of new demands. And that you're also, you know, for uh, for the first time in a long time, have these new career defining opportunities um, because of these changes that are happening. So you can go forward. So, uh, in this role play, what size organization am I running? Ah, okay. That that's what part of what we're trying to figure out. Um, we need to get clear on this solution as compared to what some of the largest competitors might be going after. So we're thinking right now mm -hmm. that it is. Um, a mid-sized enterprise, not sort of the largest. Okay. Um, okay. 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 All right. That's fine. Um, okay. So culture talk is a system to measure the collective strengths and motivations of your own team, as well as the individuals that make it up. And using the data that comes out of that, we can help you to translate into a new vision for the L and D function, as well as teach you to use the system and the methodology across your entire ecosystem. Next slide. Mm -hmm. We know that this approach is highly effective. It grew out of our work as a brand development and management consulting agency where we helped hundreds of companies and internal departments to rebrand and reposition using their culture as a foundation. And we created Culture Talk to put the power of culture 
as a tangible business tool into the hands of leaders, trainers, coaches, and consultants. Okay. Now, next slide. To say that things are on the move in L&D is an understatement, but of course I'm preaching to the choir. You already know that. Um, not only do you have to build teams and programs that are responding to the demands of new generations, but the increase in expectations for digital delivery are, are really high as well. And that was already happening before the pandemic hit. And so we know that it's now in hyperdrive. Um, in the moment, I'm sure that the extra demand of this, you know, are we going to be on site? Are we going to be hybrid? Are we going to be remote? Is only adding to the demand for additional digital delivery um, and the pace of change that you and your team are um, experiencing. It's coming at you fast. So, as all this is happening, finally, the attention and the focus on talent is also coming to the fore. So the recruiting challenges and retention challenges that many organizations are facing have finally given the L&D function a seat at the table and the you know, demand that, that, be, that, that the learning and the development um, outcomes are aligned with strategic business goals. So there's a lot going on. Next slide. So culture talk can enable you to do three strategic things. First, we help you give a voice to this new broader role and the vision for what L&D can do for the entire organization. Then we give you clear, compelling messages that can bring your team strongly on board and then quickly shift old beliefs and capabilities about the limitations of the L&D function, both for your team, at the C-suite, and again, across the enterprise, helping them to understand your new capabilities. And finally, we teach you how to do this too, as you learn the underlying construct of the culture talk system and adopt a new culture language that can serve as the foundation for a continuous learning environment. Next slide. So let me break down this approach for you. Our first step is to work directly with the L&D team. We'll conduct two related assessments to uncover the historic motivations and beliefs and behaviors of your team. In essence, we'll, we'll get to what your core culture is. And then we'll understand what are the motivations of the individual contributors on the team. Then we'll lead you through a series of workshops to help you find the voice that, de that your department has and that it needs to um, form and take shape. One that's addressing these pressing needs um, to develop a continuous learning environment and in context and in step with the business strategies. We'll work with you to develop clear statements um, that will position the department and help the whole enterprise understand what they can expect from your team. The second step is we'll teach you how to implement this same thing by validating and activating these same tools as you build clear action steps to make sure that this is cemented um, and that this transformation is really going to take root both on your team and throughout the organization. In essence, we're teaching you how to use a culture code. And finally, your team will have the ability to roll out this vision across the organization with access to the same set of tools to use with your customers. Next slide. This streamlined approach brings value very quickly. Let me share with you a story of how it helped at Turner Entertainment at a time when the cable television industry was undergoing a complete metamorphosis. The research team leadership reached out to us for help as they saw their function really becoming quite irrelevant um, in the face of the, the new streaming demands um, that were in new companies like Netflix that were coming online. Next slide. We began with a leadership team and then conducted a two day retreat. They were really relieved to be able to come to the table, um, voice their concerns about the pace of change they were facing and have a chance to share their observations, their ideas, and also their fears. Using the results from the two culture talk assessments, um, we gave their team a common language and that helped to people get people on the same page very quickly and it made the conversations immediately effective. Uh, leaders returned to work after that session with a clear vision of the challenges they faced and how they needed to change, and the impact was already beginning to take hold. 
Several months later, they were still deeply engaged with the methodology, um, and that was off on their own, even without our involvement. Um, they were experiencing radical results. Uh, the director was able to clearly identify a succession plan, which had been eluding her. Um, assistant directors were better able to identify and manage the strengths and the limitations of their own direct reports. So we came back uh, several months later at their request and conducted an off uh, a day long offsite with the entire research department, taking them through similar processes to help them understand how their role and their department um, had changed and that they needed to really work together as a team um, and come together around this new culture to overcome this existential challenge that the industry was actually facing. Next slide. And the changes were both, you know, very noticeable at the departmental level and in the C-suite. Next slide. Organizational leaders started asking this department leader, what did you do? Your team is behaving completely differently. And we're seeing much more proactive behaviors, effective deliverables, and strategic thinking coming out of the research department. So whatever you're doing, keep it up. And that was the kind of results um, that was very, very tangible to this leader as she had really effectively, within the course of six to nine months, um, really repositioned her department in the eyes of the organization. Next slide. Another great example is unfolding right now at a very large federal government agency where multiple trainers in the organization design and training departments are using the tools and the methodology to both reposition their team and work with clients at a departmental and individual level. And many other organizations, as you can see around the US and the world are putting this thinking into play as well. Next slide. Culture talk is a system that can be applied to multiple challenges. So the reason we use this methodology um, to help you reposition your team is because one of the primary things it can do is to help with the brand and the vision conversation. At the organizational level, we can think about um, the employment brand as well as the brand for a particular unit or department like yours. Um, we can help with the evolution and the shift that you need to do to help you understand how do I go from where we are today to a desired future state? How do we make that transition and that change? And even help um, subgroups and teams within the organization to identify where they're, um, where they're alike and where they're acting differently. Some of the challenges that L&D face can be also solved using the Culture Talk suite of tools, um, such as onboarding through employment branding and um, onboarding and hiring processes, as well as helping individuals understand their role and their function and where to add their strengths um, to a team. So there's many different use, use cases for the system and your team will be trained to use the tools um, actively for their own department, as well as in their training engagements throughout the organization. Next slide. So how would we begin this process? Uh, we have a clear path um, with two work streams. The first is a baseline audit and action plans. That would unfold through discovery with both qualitative and quantitative research. Um, and then we would have a series of workshops that result in a clear positioning of your department along with action plans to cement this new understanding um, and this new positioning and then communicate it uh, to the organization so they can understand what to expect from your team. Concurrently, we can um, train your team using the Culture Talk certification process and that would involve a series of statements and um, a series of trainings and workshops that would help your team to understand the methodology as well as the, um, the use, use cases throughout the organization. Next slide. There are other people that are um, engaged in this level of work, and I'm sure that you're familiar with some of the larger ones. I think what really makes Culture Talk stand out is that we have a very streamlined approach that can be very cost effective as well. Um, with a minimum investment on your part, you're not only 
getting a very tangible takeaway to lead your own function in your department in a more effective way, but you're also getting the emphasis um, on a new tool and a, a tool that you can use actively. So you can um, sort of kill two birds with one stone by partnering with Culture Talk to learn this methodology. Um, there are other organizations um, that are fully invested in the learning and development space, but the vast majority of them do not know how to help you create a message that will move you forward. So they can help you to learn tools, and we're not saying that's not important. We completely agree that that needs to happen, but the ability to message that is a clear differentiator for Culture Talk. So a quick look at the platform itself um, includes two validated assessments, as I've shared, um, as well as many different workshops, facilitation materials to take the learning that you've done um, as you're putting it into action. Those things are available then to, to roll that culture conversation out across your team. Okay. Um, when is your... When is your presentation? We, we are um, we're attending the um, ATD conference, and our intention is to um, try and identify a couple of prospects to get in front of. We don't expect it to be a, a formal conversation at the conference, but uh, the ability to use some of the thinking. When is the, the conference? Uh, end of August. Okay, we have time. So. Uh, this is going to take a little bit of work to uh, to streamline, but I'll give you a few things to work on, and then please come back at the next private roundtable so we can work more on it. Because okay. I have a time limit here. Um, first and foremost, um, see, I by the way, there is uh, Lee Barnard here who has given you a whole lot of questions and feedback that you should take a look at. I think his some of his feedback is very relevant. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll give you a few of mine. You know, I'm listening to you, and, you know, it took me too long to get interested. So one possibility is you could start with the Turner case study right up front, as early in the conversation as possible, because that's when I started getting interested. Oh, you, you've done this for Turner, and you've done something for Turner. I don't know yet what you've done for Turner. I can see you've done something for Turner that, uh, that Turner found useful. And it's not ROI. What you're providing here is a testimony. You haven't done an ROI analysis. You haven't shown any ROI analysis. What you ROI, by the way, uh, there's a whole curriculum module within pricing on ROI, you should go study that and try to frame this in the context of an ROI framework. But, but when I listen to this Turner portion, I'm like, okay, you've done something for Turner that Turner has found useful. That's my takeaway. Then you say, oh, I have all these other brands that I've done this for. They have also found it useful. Bombardier, Airbus, these are big names. So yeah, you've, you've obviously done something for a bunch of important companies, you know, well-known companies that they found useful, so I should be listening to you. And then, so this intrigue factor of engaging people needs to be brought much earlier in the process. Okay. Most of the pitch seems like a consulting pitch. So, um, so that's the question that you're going to need to address is, are, are you pitching consulting? Is it is it a consulting project that you're pitching along with some, and is it a methodology? Are there actually, is there actually software involved that, you know, so that there is a slide that you did later on, which is this one, the tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This also, you may want to bring up front and explain what is it that you're offering? So, okay. so you need to reorder the pitch quite a bit to, to address these questions to see what is it that people are buying. And if you can create an ROI equation that would go a long way in, you know, because you're starting with the $45,000 price point and what is the value of that from an ROI point of view is something you may want to try to quantify. It's not easy to quantify culture, but if you can find a way to do that, um, that would definitely carry weight. Okay. Um, so, so I want you to think about you. To me, this is a consulting pitch. 
Is that what you want? So this was definitely a, a new idea that we're trying on. Um, what we what we recognized is yes to answer your question. In this case, um, we wanted to understand if this consulting offer, which we have you know a clear path and experience um, to share. Could it get us in the door at a, at the highest level? We we have been requested to come in and do this project multiple times, and people get a By lot the of way, value. I, I have no problems with this being a consulting pitch for exactly that reason. It gets you in the door, and you can start working with these people as long as it's a you know it's a forty five thousand dollar consulting pitch. No problem. If that gets you in the door and gets you to build the relationships and start working with these people, great. Now. The thing that I, the other thing that I want, I was kind of stumped on is that I'm the head of L and D in a mid-sized enterprise, and you are giving me this flywheel of various different use cases. Which use case am I supposed to care about? So I would like you to think deeply about what is the most likely use case that a head of L and D is likely to have. Around which you build this pitch. So I would position this much more tightly. Because okay. the LND organization is not hiring. Retain maybe, not hire. The uh, LND organization is not necessarily doing the branding. Marketing is doing the branding. Recruitment is HR, but not LND. Retention maybe to some extent. So what is what value proposition for the L&D organization do you want to work with? And or the other way to think about it is this is kind of put the L&D organization in the middle with this methodology and then on the spokes you have all these other different organizations that they interface with. You want to work with recruiting, you want to work with retention, you want to work with um, you know marketing to project a a certain culture image to the world and so forth, but but I think there is a um, there is a too much kind yes. of like motherhood and apple pie feel to this pitch that you need to tighten and bring get control of. Is like this is what we're going to do for you. For you're going to spend forty five thousand dollars with me. We're going to do this for you. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So if you. you're so here, listen to me. If, if the pitch is that I'm going to help you hire, because if you can project a great culture, a great learning culture, a great culture message to recruitment, that is an interesting viewpoint. It's an interesting positioning because the, a lot of industries are facing talent wars. If you come to the tech industry, the tech industry is steeped in talent wars. So, you know, projecting a, a culture message, uh, a career growth message, et cetera, et cetera, to the Employee is very important. So, so you could then pitch like, okay, we're going to help you position to the potential recruits. And that's a, that's the positioning. I would, I would be kind of aware of what that positioning is before going into a pitch. Absolutely. So yeah. why don't we take that feedback and work on it and come back next week's private and we'll work on it, work on it more another rev. Beautiful. Thank you. That was super helpful. We will. We'll see you next week, Shermana. Very welcome. All right. Do we have any other pitch today, Maureen? No. Okay, great. So Monica is not pitching. No, got it. All right. Okay. We will go to a quick segment on how to use 1 million by 1 million. So I have an ask from you guys, if you like what we do here, bring serious entrepreneurs into one M by one M who want to, you know, work seriously on building any size company. We don't care as long as you want to build a company. It could be a million dollar company, $5 million company, no problem. Or it could be a billion dollar company, but you need to be a serious entrepreneur, whatever scale entrepreneurship, it needs to be a serious effort. Um, all our resources are at one M by one M.com. You'll find a terrific blog. You'll find the Entrepreneur Journey's book series on Amazon, 12 books, all case study based. 
These roundtables happen every week. You can come back as many times as you want. You can pitch for free once. After that, if you want ongoing relationship, ongoing you know, interaction, message, uh, mentoring exercises, those are part of the premium program. That is, um, it's an annual membership fee-based premium program. You can be in the program for many, many years. A lot of people just stay in the program for many, many years. Just one second. Um, and you are going to get help with methodology. You're going to have access to our curriculum, help with business development, strategy consulting. We also help you with financing if you are fundable. That's something we will assess and guide you on what your funding strategy needs to be. And by the way, there are alternative funding mechanisms, not just VC. There are other kinds of funding that we work with as well. Um, use the self-assessment to assess your strategy. It's important, this is what the due diligence questions are from VCs, so it would be helpful for you to get on top of this. A free bootstrapping course, one hour bootstrapping course is available, pinned to the top of the blog. Please do that one, it's helpful. Um, and we have a lot of very reasonably priced Udemy courses, 25 courses that we have released this summer based on the UDM, uh, one m by one m methodology. So you can find all of that also and, uh, and get your learning. So we have a, a lot of things we discussed today with Jeff, bootstrapping with a paycheck, bootstrapping with services, bootstrapping with by piggybacking, solo entrepreneurship. We have courses on each of those pieces of the one m by one m methodology. You're very welcome to get those. The courses are priced at mostly $40. There are some that are about um, 80 bucks, but Udemy runs a lot of promos. So if you're strategic about it, you can acquire these courses for very reasonable prices, 10, 15 bucks each. Um, and if you want to access the 1M by 1M curriculum in its entirety, that is $99 per month, 1M by 1M basic, that's also fine. So figure out how you want to learn, how you want to use the resources, go dig out, on, dig on the website, learn basic, premium, et cetera, et cetera, and figure out how you want to, you know, absorb the material and develop your strategy of entrepreneurship. There's lots of FAQs, video FAQs. The curriculum is described in full. It is a case study based curriculum. We have over a thousand successful entrepreneurs and we are, you know, doing a very serious job of teaching on the basis of these case studies. And lots of people are learning based on that. Our investor introduction philosophy is also stated clearly on the website. There's a whole section on it. Please go through that. If you're joining the program to get investor introductions, please be aware of what the criteria are. Um, our methodology is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startup philosophy, bootstrap first, raise money later. Um, that's it. The next round tables are there's one more in July the 29th of July, and then there are three more in August that would complete our summer roundup. And then uh, we are going to go to the fall program. And in the fall, we're starting a co-branded accelerator on top of the regular 1M by 1M program. We're also starting a co-branded accelerator with data stacks, which is gonna be launched on September 9th, and that's for the open source community, uh, the NoSQL no open source community. Cassandra users and so forth. So you'll hear a lot more about that in the fall. Okay, I hope you found it useful. Lee, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Please come back, absolutely. We can take a little bit of questions. I have a packed day today. So I like meeting, 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 meeting. So uh, I will quickly do questions. If you have questions, I will quickly do Q&A. Irina Patterson is your contact if you have questions about the 1M by 1M program. Um, Irina at 1mby1m.com is her contact. So very quickly, questions, anybody, please feel free to ask. Lee Barnard, what is the best place to start with your program? Lee, I'm not sure what you are doing. Um, a best place to start would be if you already are working on something, come to one of these free round tables. It happens every Thursday almost. And come and uh, do your pitch and let's dialogue and, and I can then give you very specific feedback. Um, 
If you have concerns about publicly discussing your idea, then I would suggest you need to join the premium program straight away. Um, and that's the only way I would be able to actually give you feedback within the within a private uh, lounge. It's not one on one private, but it's private roundtable. Excellent. We are huge fans of bootstrapping. All right. Anybody else? Okay. So, folks, uh, I will see you soon, premium members. I'll see you at the private roundtable next week, and um, others, I'll see you at the public roundtable next week. Be well, be safe, and see you soon.